Welcome to another edition of the podcast known as Blending the Family. I'm your host, Tommy Maloney. Just woke up from a nap. Oh, naps are so good. I love naps. Where's Otis? There he is. Otis is in the corner. Recording again from my wife's office because... If you haven't heard the story, by the way, I am Tommy Maloney. I host this podcast. I'm the executive producer. Uh, I am the sound guy. I am the guy who writes the questions. I do the conversations. On this podcast, we talk about things that are important to blended families. We talk about uh, technology. Uh, We talk about men's mental health. So if this is your first time listening, thanks for coming by. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Otis appreciates it. Let me see if I can see him. He's, he's, uh, he's in his own world right now. So I digress. I, like I said, I just woke up from a nap. I don't know what happens to our uh, bodies when we just lay down on the couch. I feel like there's a there's like an energy monster underneath the couch, and they just suck it out of you. And it just feels so good. So good. Uh, matter of fact, Odie and I, a.k.a. Otis, my fur baby, we went to the dog park today, and it was it got a little overcrowded. And I think that at one point, watching Otis, Otis to me is like, Like, uh, back in the day when they actually had a, you know, I mean, they still have a Walmart greeter and they give you the the cart, but, you know, back in the day they really had a Walmart greeter and and I feel at times that Otis is like that. He just runs from pack to pack to dog to dog, just sniffing butts and just saying hi. And today it looked like he looked around and said, oh dear God, there's a lot of dogs here. And so we were there for... Usually we're at the dog park for about a good two hours, uh, except, well, last night. As soon as I got uh, back in town from Cali, uh, California, I uh, got home uh, a little bit after six, changed clothes. He and I went to the dog park, and oh my gosh, it was cold here in northern Colorado. I had shorts on like an idiot, so we are only at the park for maybe an hour. But I love taking them to the dog park. I, I just... It, you could have a, a crappy day. Uh, you can you can watch crappy news, but you go to the dog park, and things are just right in the world. I mean, when we were there last night, that's what a lady said. She goes, "I I just feel so much better just watching the dogs. It's great therapy." And I know I I've mentioned this before. Uh, I have a dear friend named Dakota, whose mom is a psych psychiatrist always get those mixed up anyway um i i know this this is a this might come off as oh you're trying to be uh one of those people but i really do feel better <laughs> when uh, i'm around dogs when i'm around otis and i i i i would like to have otis as my uh uh, what do you call it? Uh, my social anxiety dog. I don't know what to call it. I'm sorry. But I, I do. I feel so much better when I'm at the dog park and just watching the dogs. Because what I do at the dog park, I do laps. And I just walk and walk. And as I'm walking, I'm either listening to a, uh, someone else's podcast. I'm listening to music. Uh, there are times where I, I'm doing neither just walking and it's just so stress relieving just seeing how fun the the dogs are playing together now there are times and and again there was way too many dogs today way too many and a couple of them a couple of them were uh mean well they they got into it two other dogs got into it and again, it's it's that alpha mentality. So, anyway, Odie is a 
little tired, and that's a good thing. So here we are. Did you like my dissertation of dog parks? <laughs> On this podcast, oh, man, I don't have water. I forgot to grab water. Um, on this podcast, I had the pleasure, uh, speaking of the, speaking with the co-owners of Divorce Family Mediations, Jan and Jillian Yuhas, Y-O-Y, Y-U-H-A-S. I love their name. I love their last name, Yuhas. Um, and I had spoken to him before and they were in the process of moving from my hometown of Chicago to uh, the burbs of Dallas. And I had to give them a little ribbing about moving from Chicago. But, uh, you know, the weather in Chicago is not everybody's cup of tea. I get it. Especially the winters. The winters can be really brutal. But anyway, you'll hear that uh, at the end. Uh, Jen and Jillian were fantastic. We actually talk uh, about co-parenting apps, um, the three C's. This was so cool. Um, where's the other one? Oh, um, we versus me. And where is it? Where's the other? oh facts versus feelings? These are things you're going to learn. And and one other thing I want to mention. Uh, before I, I, I want to talk about one other thing, is uh, both Jan and uh, Jillian bring up the importance of the parenting agreement, and I can't stress that enough. I really can't. And I, if I wasn't in such a a uh, a shock uh, during my divorce, I would have had the cojones to fix. Uh, the parenting agreement, but um, as if, if you've if you're a regular listener to this podcast, uh, Connor's eighteen, and um, I made the mistake of not going back and getting it changed, and that's something I have to live with, and I don't want you to live with that. So, uh, like I said. Um, the ladies, uh, Jan and Jillian, talk about parenting agreements, and I cannot tell you how important it is to get um, or have professional uh, legal representation in the parenting agreement. Make sure it's fair on both sides, and personally, I should have had it amended, and I never did. So I need to mention that to you. Whew. What else is going on? Um, it, this is a... Um, I, I was hoping it would be a, an official bachelor weekend where it would be um, uh, the boy, as the girls like to call him, Connor, uh, Otis, and myself. Um, but uh, So my wife, Ann, and Becca, um, and um, so Becca is Ann's... My bonus daughter, who's 19, they're he- they were in Omaha this weekend for a wedding. And congratulations to the Johnson family, dear friends. But, uh, yeah, I was hoping that Connor didn't have to work, but he has to work. So it's okay. It's, it's Otis and I. And actually, I was invited uh, to a friend's house, my my dear friend Tracy, who um, is my is my uh, my uh, what do you, I don't want I don't know what to call her other than a great friend who picks me up every Monday morning and picks me up every Friday from the airport to and from the airport on during the week and she invited me over uh, with her husband Kevin and they were having friends over that uh, Ann and I have met and I'm just like. Ah, I'm, I, I like my I like my alone time and that's and my Otis time as well. So like I said, I went to the dog park last night. We'll go again tomorrow morning uh, before we have to pick up uh, Ann and Becca from the airport. And it's funny because last night when I got uh, or no, it was 
I was I like to read the horoscope. I do. I I mean I don't follow it, but my horoscope for today said uh, I would be attending a social event, which is not true because I said no, I'm not attending a social event. So their horoscope, <laughs> take that. I watched today, <coughs> excuse me, on Hulu. Um, I don't have my phone. Shoot. Jim Brockmeyer. It's a Hank Azaria uh, show that originally was on IFC, but Hulu has it. Um, Jim Brockmeyer. So Hank Azaria's character plays um, a somewhat washed up uh, uh, play by play, baseball play by play announcer. And I happened to. I don't know what podcast I was listening to. Shoot. But they were talking about this this show, and recently Hank Azaria was on Stephen Colbert's show. And I'm like, I'm going to have to check it out. So that's uh, what I did today after we came back from the park. And I'm, ad- I'm addicted to it. I don't know how many seasons they did, but I'm addicted to it. Also... The new updated version of The Mighty Ducks. I've seen the first episode. I liked it. I know there's uh, currently uh, three episodes, so probably tonight I'll watch those. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm. Every once in a while, I, I, I'm like anti TV, but I don't know. I, I, I like finding these little nuggets. Um, like I said, the Hank Azaria, um, the Mighty Ducks. Uh, there's one documentary that um, my wife Ann and I like watching. Oh, I can no, oh, I can't pull it up. Let's see if I can Google it real quick. It's a show with, and I want to give credit where credit is due. Come on. This is, and before I get into what this this documentary that Ann and I love, really do love watching together, I'm recording the this episode. If again, if you haven't been a regular listener from my wife's office, normally I record in my home office, which is downstairs, and I love my setup. I have a standing desk, you know, the microphone, just a great vibe in there. But uh, I somehow screwed up my computer, my MacBook Pro, which is nine years old. Um, Hopefully, um, Apple is supposed to come out with the new MacBook Pros with the new M1 chip. Um, Ewan McGregor. E-W. Ewan McGregor. Here we go. I have to share. I have to share this with you. So if you have uh, Apple, I think Apple TV or Apple Plus TV, um, I didn't know there was more of these documentaries. Let me. See, I gotta find these. Oh, where is it? But let's see, you have McGregor. Where's where's? All right, let's try this. You have McGregor. Um. Uh, Doc. Long way up. Long way up. And I know he's done these other ones, but Long Way Up is him and his best friend, Charlie. Um, Let's see. Where's... Where's... Oh, Charlie Borman. B-O-O-R-A-M. R... B O O R M A N. So, uh, Yoon and Charlie on this new one, 
they started in South America and yeah let's see um, yeah South America and are, are riding electric Harley Davidson motorcycles from there all the way up to California and I I promised Anne that I I would definitely not go ahead <laughs> And, and, you know, watch episodes without her because this is something we really in, do enjoy. And anyway, I, I, like I said, I'm not, I don't, the, when I'm on the road, the only time the TV is on is either I'm watching hockey, huge hockey fan, uh, diehard Blackhawk fan. And this past week on PBS, they had the th- uh, three part series, uh, the Ernest Hemingway, um, uh, uh, Ken Burns um, program and it was it was good. What I, I I don't know. I didn't think it was great. I thought it was good. It was okay. Um, I don't read a lot of Hemingway as I you know dive into that for you real quickly. Uh, my dad got me a book of uh, of uh, Hemingway's short stories and I and one of the uh, pieces in the documentary uh, they of the Ernest Hemingway they talk about this one story and it I haven't gotten through it because I don't there was there was just too many characters and I'm trying to keep up with the characters and then and I couldn't keep up and so I just lost interest and I'd read these other short stories and just they they didn't talk to me I guess I'm just not a a fiction reader. Um, but yeah, but I, I enjoyed watching uh, the Ken Burns thing on Ernest Hemingway. So, so there. That's 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 my life in a nutshell. Whew. All right, on the IG on the Instagram, you can find Jan and Jillian Uhas at Divorce Family Mediations. Uh, their website is also Divorce family uh, mediations.com so again we're going to talk about um, how to help your blended family how to help you if you are going through divorce um, it was just we had a we had a great time we had some technical issues which it happens but it's all good but I really want you to pay attention to um, really Three things that I took out of this interview, and number one, definitely is number one, when you're uh, contacting your spouse through, and both um, Jan and Jillian recommend email, facts versus feelings, okay? Facts versus feelings. Take out the feelings in the email. Uh, Number two, you're going to hear them talk about we versus me. And the three C's, the three C's, um, calm, concise, and create, or constructive. Calm, concise, constructive. The three C's, okay? So again, Jan, Jillian, Juhas, you can find them at Divorce Family Mediations. You can find them on the IG, Divorce Family family mediations. Hey, you can find me on the Twitter, on the Facebooky, on the Instagrammy, um, at blending family. That's blending family. And there you are. There you go. Whew. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I, uh, I sound like I'm drunk and I'm not. Like I said, I just woke up from a nap and go, Hey, I gotta get this podcast going. And I was just looking at Otis. He's so cute when he's napping. So there you go. Have a great day. Um, If you're going for a run listening to this podcast, would love to know how you listen to this podcast. You can email me at Tommy at BlendingTheFamily.com. Crap. Holy crap. I forgot to tell you. Don't forget to uh, purchase the pre-order of my book, my new book, uh, my dad's advice at 5.04 a.m. I'm an idiot when it comes to self-promoting. 
My Dad's Advice at 5.04 a.m. is my new book. Go to the website, mydadsadvicebook.com, mydadsadvicebook.com to order the book. I am an idiot. I, I'll say one more thing. There, there's a great video, uh, Simon Sinek, um, talks about being the, what is he, the idiot in the room. I'm just an idiot in any room. As Terry Crews would say, and if you if you're going for a run, this might be it, uh, or or even if you're walking your dogs, or maybe you're at the dog park listening to this, or going cross country. Say it with me. If if you're new to this, this is something that could be your mantra. This is how we end the this podcast every time. So as Terry Crews would say, your success is my success. <laughs> oh my gosh. Whew. I think I pulled a muscle. <laughs> well, uh, good morning, ladies. Good morning. good morning. Is it too early to put some clue in my coffee right now? Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> what time is it by you? Uh, I'm an hour behind you, so it's 9.22. Ah, yeah. It's it's still maybe a little bit early for that, but hey, it's a hey. sad day. Do what you got to do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Wow. All right. Um, so we good? Are we all set now? I think we're good. All I think right. we're good. We got these <laughs> technology glitches figured out. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, How do you pronounce your last name, ladies? You Haas. I was right. I didn't want to mess it up, but I, I that where what is that? Uh, what's the uh, origin of you Haas? Our father's family is Czech, so somewhere over there. I think it. I'm not for sure. Originally, the spelling used to actually be with a J, and then I don't know where it transitioned into a Y. But yeah, somewhere over in Europe, Czech area. You has. That's a, that's a, I'm sure you might get a lot of uh, conversation starters with that. Well, it's very, cause it's such a very uh, not common, I would say last name. So then I do, when people like reach, I've gotten requests on like Facebook of other people with that last name. So it's very strange because you never hear it, but I've probably heard it two or three other times in my life. So it is very unique. So when you hear it, yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's a great name. It's a great last name. <laughs> I, Thanks. If, if there was any kind of voting, I'd vote for your uh, last name, ladies, as as the best. <laughs> I'll take it. Awesome. So, <laughs> Jan and Jillian, how did you two go into business together? Because I'm an only child. I I don't know how to how how siblings relate. Um, the only way I can relate to siblings is what I've seen in our household with my two bonus daughters. And when they have the, the sister little arguments, I'm like a turtle and I have to go into my shell because I don't, I don't handle conflict very well. And, you know, be, feel free, feel free to analyze me the, you know, during this, this, uh, episode, but how did, how did you two end up? you know, working together and, and creating uh, a business together? I think being, well, definitely being identical twins is a little bit different than siblings because we do have other siblings. And even though, while when you grow up in the same household, you do have similarities based on, you know, parenting and how you're raised, you know, that whole nature versus nurture thing, you're going to have a lot of uh, um, different ways of functioning that are similar when you have siblings, but she, she and I do not argue or have really disagreements with our other siblings, but we do with our, with each other, because I think we do spend so much time together and we are so much alike. And then also in terms of running businesses together, usually we always have the kind of same mindset or same goals that we're striving towards, but sometimes there's, you know, differences of how to do something that comes up in terms of running companies together but she kind of she and I've always got started on this path we used to volunteer at a crisis 
hotline for teens who ran away from home. And we used to mediate between the teens and the parents in order to resolve that family discord and find alignment from the teen's perspective and the parent's perspective. And that's what fueled our passion into going into grad school and getting our master's in marriage and family therapy. And then after that, we became certified in coaching and certified family mediators. What um, what similarities do you two have when it comes to parenting styles or even um, looking at other families? What what commonality do you two have? I think we both believe in like letting the child identify what makes them feel good. Like you need to let the child to learn to develop who they are and not force them to do things they don't want to do, but inspire them. I think, you know, every child's going to be different in the family dynamics. And so you have to treat each child as you, their own unique person, but also show them respect versus try to control them, but work with them and try to just like encourage them, um, constantly nurture like their strengths and if there's weaknesses, help them learn through those weaknesses so that they don't hold themselves back, but understand that they may not be good at everything, but they're also learning what works to their benefit and maybe where they need to work a little bit harder. So just constantly being a, a good support system for your children, but also understanding them as who they are as an individual and trying to look through their lens, how they view the world, what their belief system looks like. How do you two have uh, opposite styles um and how she and i think do think differently so i jan think in bigger pictures when i think about how to resolve things or where i see things going i think of what the bigger picture is going to look like and jillian thinks more in specific details in order to create that bigger picture so that's where we are different in our thinking approaches and it works well in terms of balancing each other out. So creative solutions, what type of creative solutions can you two offer uh, myself? Because I'm sure uh, with three kids, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I know I'm not the perfect parent, um, but what, what kind of creative solutions today can you help with our, our audience when it comes to co-parenting and, you know, making sure that there is a, you know, a, a successful uh, co-parenting dynamics? Well, no parent is going to be perfect. No human is perfect. That's what makes us all unique in terms of our own characteristics and what each one of us brings individually to the table in our relationships and families. Um, so we definitely have to embrace that individuality and uniqueness that each person brings to the family dynamic. When it comes to helping families and children that are going through divorce or in blended families, sometimes you're gonna see regression in behaviors or outbursts of anger. And a lot of times that can frustrate a parent as they don't know how to really help their child. Instead, sometimes they will discipline them for angry outbursts. And really what we need to do is understand, help me help us understand how come you're having a bad day? What can I do for you? You don't seem like you're being yourself today. Can you help mommy or can you help daddy understand what's upsetting you? So we really need to understand the child because children don't always have the verbal communication to really articulate their emotions and the feelings of what they're experiencing. So they're going to show you through their behaviors. And so it, it takes a parent to take a step back and not get frustrated or and want to discipline right away, but to really have that heart to heart conversation with their child. Yeah, I, you, you bring up a great point because the, the thing I had to learn was going from, you know, raising a son where it was just he and I, and then getting into uh, our blended family and um, having at the time to try and think, uh, Betsy was... Uh, early high school, Becca was still in grade school. And one of the biggest takeaways that um, I learned and 
at times, luckily for me, I'm, I'm really good at taking a step back and, and observing. And through that, I understood the two dynamics between the girls. And that was Betsy, who's the older, when she came home from school, she just cracked the book, got the homework done. And then with Becca, she would come home and she had to have the TV on. She had to decompress. And it took me a while to figure out, all right, what do I need to do as a parent? How do I, you know, support these two different learning styles, so to speak? And I I feel that a lot of times when uh, we get into a new relationship that we put the hammer down and that's not healthy for the kids. It's not healthy for the relationship. So I think that a lot of times, like you were saying, Jan, is that we need to really look at the situation and not overreact. I mean, like you were saying about, you know, having a bad day, what, what's the root cause? What is going on versus just overreacting? Correct. We want to learn to respond versus react. And so we can do that through discovery questions by assessing versus assuming that, you know, something's going on because we don't know what the child's really experiencing without really understanding and asking them questions. Just like as adults, we need to ask our co-parent, you know, how do they feel about this? What are their thoughts on this and work together? And so really just having that connection is critical to like success in raising children. So Jan and Jillian, I would love to hear if you have one or two success stories, because I always firmly believe that stories really educate. What one or two success stories have you two uh, had with families that you've helped? We help a lot of our families in terms of setting healthy boundaries and in adjusting the communication style so each parent feels respected. Most of the time when there's a conflict in a co-parenting situation, it's because they're going at each other. So currently I have a family and they've just because we've transitioned into asking more questions, one parent is a little bit more of an aggressive communicator and the other parent shuts down when the other parent is being aggressive. And so that's why we were hitting an impasse and not getting anywhere in terms of their communication and trying to do what was best for the children's needs. So we adjusted their communication style in order for the aggressive type of communicator or the demanding communicator to ask more discovery questions and ask the other co-parent if this works for them or what would work for them in terms of giving different options to choose from. So just like we give children two options, like do you want eggs or pancakes for breakfast? And then they might choose, oh, I want pancakes today. That teaches a child to have confidence and make decisions for themselves. We do the same thing when it comes to co-parenting. Does five o'clock or six o'clock work for you in terms of can I FaceTime the kids? So we're giving that parent respect of their boundaries in terms of what works for their schedule and their life. And we're working together just by asking questions and trying to find that happy ground that meets everybody's needs on a respectful level. Can you go into a little more deeper dive with that? Because I think that's a great, that's a great example as far as, you know, two people with different communication styles. Um, Mm -hmm. What, what other um, types of examples like that? Because I, that's, that's brilliant right there. So that's, yeah, that's the main glitch that most co-parents have is because there's also usually a lot of anger or resentment and they haven't really forgiven each other. So that comes out in their co-parenting is they're trying to control the other person in what needs to happen. And they're going from a me mindset versus a we mindset. So we as parents need to figure out how we are going to help the children and meet their needs versus I want it my way and you want it your way. And we get into that like power struggle, which becomes, you know, counterproductive to the whole co-parenting relationship. So when, when each parent can get outside of their me mindset and put a we mindset together, like we are in the business of raising these children together and meeting their needs. That's where we're going to see growth in terms of finding 
much more peaceful interactions in the, you know, family dynamics. And I think a lot of times too, co-parents are still operating as if they were still married, where they have to start a new relationship with each other in regards to making the children number one priority. And that relationship is a new one that they have to recreate, you know, recreate Mm -hmm. from once that divorce process is settled. One of the words you, uh, used was forgiving and i i struggle with that because part of me thinks and maybe maybe with uh, your experience jan and jillian maybe with your experience you can you can uh, see where i'm going with this and that is forgiving am i to forgive my former spouse or, or I don't have to verbalize it, but I can internal forgive my former spouse. Does that make sense? Yes. Forgiveness is not necessarily about forgiving the other person for their actions or whatever, you know, pain or anger they may have caused you in the marriage. Forgiveness we do for ourselves so we can find our own inner peace and let go and move on with our lives. So you don't, have, you don't have to forgive and like forget. It's more or less, it's just for your, it's for your own need. And you don't even have to share that with the other parent if you don't want to, but writing yourself a letter, journaling, those are all great tools in terms of being able to forgive this person in terms of how they did you wrong in letting out that anger onto paper and getting it out of your mind, getting it out of your head and really letting it go. So you can just move on in your own life. Because if you don't let go of that hurt or anger, you're allowing your past to control your life. And we can only find happiness in the present moment. Yeah. You're not condoning the behavior that they did. And a lot of times we have to understand the other co-parent may not have the tools or skill sets to deal with their emotional state as the reason why they made did some of the things that hurt you in that process. And so that relationship from the past. And so a lot of times you have to under, like see outside of the situation, like take that step back and almost like look in and understand, okay, they don't know how to actually like talk about their feelings or they don't know how to actually express or ask for what it is that they need. It doesn't make it right or wrong, but we also have to understand not everyone is capable of having the skills to actually have healthy relationships. And and that's where I struggle. That's where, um, I I don't know. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to judgmentalize it, but I do have other male friends who have that forgiveness struggle where am I supposed to, forgive that other person for, uh, you know, walking away from the marriage? Or is it, again, the internal struggle of just saying, it's a good, it's, it's a good thing that the marriage ended because of X, because, you know, I met somebody new, or um, I was able to, you know, really, truly find myself. So I know from time to time, uh, my wife will even say to me, you know, it's not necessarily the forgiveness, but it's still, she would say, you still have a little bit of anger in you. And let's see, I got divorced in 2008. And so it, it frustrates me that when my wife says that to me, not in a mean way, but in, in my way saying, why, why haven't I let this little bit of anger go? And, and I'm sure you, you two ladies run into that with your clients possibly as well. So a lot of times we hold on to anger because we're living in our head versus operating from our heart. And so when our ego gets in our way, because we feel emotionally bruised, we got to drop that E and ego and let go and know the fact that what was meant to be is no longer a part of our journey that it's telling us we need to move forward and know that we did all that we could in the situation and know that now we have a better life because what's meant for us is going to show up in in our life. And I truly believe like the universe 
puts people in front of us, just like you're now happily married with a new wife. And so you're able to know that in that moment that like your past is your past. It's no longer a part of you. Now it was an experience, but it doesn't control how you shouldn't control how you feel today. And so you got, when you get tap into that heart centered internalizing, you're no longer like looking outward, you're looking inward to help yourself heal. Yes. And we can only heal. Happiness comes from the inside out. And we have to take that pain and turn it into our power. I love the drop the E and go. That is, that is awesome. Well, what other, what other pieces of advice can you give to uh, families that do have some conflict? So for example, you know, with a blended family, one of the issues that I've come across with uh, other friends that are, are blended family is the former spouses. So not only, so for example, in our family, not only am I dealing with my former spouse, but my wife is dealing with her former spouse. What have you two been able to help other families with when it comes to dealing with the conflict of the other spouse so it doesn't bleed into the family dynamics? I would say one of the best strategies is to limit communication to email. And when we say that and doing it like one day a week, picking a day, let's say like Tuesdays or Wednesdays where you do an update in regards to the children, whether it's education, extracurricular activities, things of that nature. Because if there's ongoing dialogues via text message, and sometimes there's, you know, the co-parenting apps too, but a lot of times, a lot of things get misconstrued, which creates more conflict. And so when we limit communication, we're less likely to have conflict and it doesn't impact your current relationship with your spouse. And stick to the facts, not feelings. Oh, yes. Facts versus feeling. That is so true. That is so true. I I will again, uh, just writing this down. I will admit, early on in my divorce, I was one of those people. I mean, um, because I saw it. I saw it through uh, my parents' eyes, and I and I recall, you know, if I was, you know, at home with my mom. I heard my mom and dad, you know, having those arguments over the phone, you know, way, way before, way before email and texting and cell phones and all that. And because I witnessed that when I got divorced, I took on that role of, you know, essentially throwing the feelings in, the angry feelings versus the facts. And that is, again, that's just a, a, a wonderful point that you do, you should really stick with the facts and also, and I know I want to say this is common sense, but sometimes common sense leaves people's minds. And that is to, you know, make sure you're not using the kids as the middle person, uh, you know, having them as a pawn. So that's, that's, you know, I've seen that I've witnessed that. And that's not in our family, but other families. So that's, that is so key right there. The facts versus the feelings. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And we don't want to, we don't want to be arguing in front of the children that causes them emotional distress and they can internalize and self blame themselves for the divorce. If they hear their parents arguing about things that have to do with them. Um, so yeah, then that can cause all sorts of behavioral self-esteem issues. And we don't want to, we want to try to minimize that as much as possible in terms of the children are already going through enough, you know, transitioning from one home to the next um, and trying to get in used to new behaviors, new family members, new siblings, whoever's all in the mix. So yeah, if they're hearing their parents argue, it just causes a lot of uh, self-esteem issues. And then that, that can also create long-term effects in terms of how they view romantic relationships in their own life when they you know, are ready at that age to date later in adulthood. How, how would you say 
though that and i and i understand it that you know we shouldn't argue in front of our kids but how do we teach them conflict resolution well yes it's okay to have conflict conflict is not a bad thing if we don't have conflict we can't work through the underlying emotional needs that may not be met by the other person so conflict is actually usually a pretty healthy thing but it's how we approach our conflict resolution and that comes from asking discovery questions having empathy really trying to understand the other person's perspective so we can bridge the gap because the only way we can bridge the gap is to be able to see both sides of the coin in terms of how we're going to come to a resolution or even set a healthy boundary. So a lot of times people think boundaries are ultimatums or the complete opposite of that. So when we have boundaries with our co-parent or other family members, it's about bridging that gap and finding two different styles of operating and finding that middle ground that allows everybody to feel respected and their needs met in that situation. And, and it's hard. <laughs> it, you know, trying to, as, as my mom would always say, you know, when that other person is renting space in your head, you know, you need to evict them. It's, it's, it's hard at times to, again, going back to the facts versus feelings of, you know, removing the feelings because again, it goes back to what I was saying, the anger, if you still have that anger in you, the feelings are going to outweigh the facts in, in a text message in an email message. Um, and it's just, you know, you know, we're human. Um, but it, it, I remember, uh, somebody talking about divorce and, and trying to, um, run it like a business. And again, you're taking feelings out and putting facts in. Correct. And I think a lot of times too, like you said, when someone's renting space in your head, you're giving that other person power over you, which means you're disconnected from your core values. And so when you create alignment with yourself, it's much easier to navigate those conflicts in difficult situations because you're speaking your inner truth, your authenticity, because you're connected to what feels good to you based on your value system. And so the biggest thing is to shift your focus on yourself or whatever you need to like take place versus focusing so much energy on the other person, but learning to speak from within yourself versus combating what they're saying. And so a lot of times you can use the three C's of communication, calm tone of voice, concise messaging, and constructive language to really help yourself articulate what it is you need to happen in that moment. Uh, calm voice. Um, a calm, yeah, calm tone of voice because tone of voice accounts for 90% of conflict where 10% is only the words being exchanged. And then concise messaging, very short to the point, because if we go on a tangent, we're more likely to create more conflict because we're going to bring up things from the past that are unnecessary and we're no longer then focusing on that present conflict. And then constructive language, because if we want a win-win outcome, we have to be constructive versus destructive. Yeah, I, I remember uh, Stephen Covey talking about win-wins, but there is going to be the possibility where it's not going to be a win-win when it comes to co-parenting all the time. Correct. Well, win-win means that children's needs are being met. It's not necessarily about one parent getting their way. It's about what's best for the children. That's our win-win. Okay. So one parent might have to bite their tongue on their perspective if it's not going to benefit the children in the best interest of their needs. I'm happy you bring that up. So biting your tongue, does, and I'll use me as an example because I have felt that the more I bite my tongue, the more 
power I'm giving my former spouse because I'm not standing up for myself possibly. But it goes back to what is best for our kids. But again, I still feel that there are times where if I just simply bite my tongue and let that you know, spouse have not necessarily their way, but they're in, in possibly in their eyes, they just got the win. So you have to ask yourself that moment, am I fighting to have power over my ex or am I fighting for what's best for my children? And that's hard because I think that several times when we start doing that, instead of it trying to be a win-win for what's best for the kids, it becomes a competition of parents of who who's trying to be the better parent versus what again is best interest for the child so that's again operating that's creating a power struggle and we create power struggles we're operating from the ego we're not operating from our values our heart if we have co-parenting value system such as maybe you value communication you might value trust in the co-parent relationship. You could value um, time, like they're on time for pickups and drop off. When we operate from our top five values uh, in terms of the parenting relationship, that's how we get our needs met. And that's how we communicate in order to find resolution between a conflict between two parents. Our value system is connected to our emotional needs and our self-worth and to feel respected in that relationship. And just like any other, whether it's a romantic relationship, business, co-parenting, that you develop your top five values to operate from. So that meets your heart needs and that gets us out of our head into communicating from our place of self-worth. Something that was mentioned earlier and I want to go back to, and it's because I've had several of the creators on this podcast, but what's your... And, and I'm not asking you to endorse one versus another. I'm asking, have you experienced a positive with using co-parenting apps? Uh, yeah, I have a family right now that's on a co-parenting app. And it helps because there are strong personalities involved. It helps minimize some of the what well what let's say for example one parent prefers to only communicate one day a week and it's in their parenting agreement so that's what works for them they have 24 hours to get back to each other on terms of updating them on the exchange what's been going on with the kids in order to articulate anything that needs to meet the children's needs the other parent would generally cross the other parents boundaries and so the app has allowed them to minimize the conversations and it allows them to be more focused on the children versus being a free-for-all all all the time it all depends on because you there are peaceful co-parenting situations where they don't need to use the app and they respect each other and they're They've already come to that realization. They're in the business of raising their children. But then there's still some situations where it's very conflictual and we haven't got out of that me mindset into a we mindset. So then there's there's still, they haven't really forgiven each other. So there's too much anger and pain still involved in the situation to be productive when it comes to communicating. And the app minimizes that. Yeah, I really wish... <laughs> when I was going through my divorce, that there were co-parenting apps. I really feel that it would have minimized a lot of stupid stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I am, I'm just amazed where technology has advanced in co-parenting and how much it can benefit. And again, to bring, you know, using the facts versus the feelings. Uh, an app doesn't have feelings. 
an app is, you know, the facts. So I am, I am all for any technology that's going to benefit the kids. Um, I mean, I remember like my wife with her and her former spouse, they would use a notebook going back and forth. Well, if the other parent had a rough week, they're not going to be using the notebook. Maybe they don't like to write, but versus having an app right then and there being able to capture whatever data that is needed. So I'm, I'm just amazed at, again, how far technology has gone in the, in the world of co-parenting. Yeah, it really has um, expanded on such a, a bigger level. I even have another uh, another family right now. They use another app. I don't think it's strictly a co-parenting app. It's more like a journal app. So they can send pictures of the children when they're not together or when, obviously, when they one parent has the children and, and the other. So they send lots of pictures of what's going on in the child's life as well, just to keep them updated and whatnot. So yeah, it really... Co-parenting has really expanded in terms of trying to get everybody uh, functioning in a healthier manner for the, you know, benefit of the children. I, yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and again, you know, having interviewed several of, of the developers, I mean, they've, you know, they were going through, you know, their own struggles and they found you know, their why of how can we make this process better? And again, I really <laughs> wish those things were around when I was going through my struggles of divorce. <laughs> yes. I also think communicating on an app too helps. It helps. It can help delay the, or via email can help delay the process of reacting from a place of emotion. Because when you have text message, or you just want to pick up the phone and call that person, it, that is what allows people to react from emotion, which is the app allows people to be more constructive and take a pause and reflect as to more or less what they want to say, because it's like, it's a disconnect from the brain to emotionally react when you're communicating on an app. So true. Um, so this has been really exciting for me uh, to have both you, uh, Jan and Jillian Yuha on this. You two are, are very unique because I, this is the first time I've had, you know, two professionals in this, in this divorce co-parenting coaching space. I mean, I mean you, you two have a unique brand, honestly. Thank you. I mean, we truly do love helping families reach healthier dynamics and happier functioning in order to meet everybody's needs. So even both parents can find peace and then the children's, you know, children centered focus on making sure that they are smoothly able to function because it's not the divorce itself that impacts children. Children can come, we obviously have divorced parents and it didn't really impact us in a negative way. Our parents never really argued in front of us or anything of that nature. And they found a way to um, raise us still. And <laughs> we've gone on to, you know, want to help other families. So it does. it's not the divorce itself that can have a negative impact on the children. It's how the divorce is handled that impacts the children's well-being. Well, again, I mean, I'm just, well, personally grateful you, you guys came on the podcast, but also, you know, the, the work you do, I mean, you two have, again, a very unique business model. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm grateful for your, um, thoughts so that that means a lot to us because it's really we're really passionate about it so I mean because you know your your family went through divorce but at the same time what what drives you to what what is I guess the the cliche question is what gets you two out of bed every day to serve others what is it 
just being able to help people overcome their struggles and find their strengths. Um, you know, we all have our personal struggles. And I think just knowing that there's always light and love outside of whatever that struggle may be, but what's the lesson behind it and how can we use it to push ourselves forward and just truly believe in ourselves, knowing that life doesn't always have to be so challenging or difficult. There's, you know, there is a bigger picture. There is more energy that we have to see past even when we're feeling the pain so intensely. And so I think just knowing the fact that we can help people overcome that and support them and be empathetic and be able to understand them is just a gift and a blessing. And we're happy to be able to like be there for our clients. What, what have you two learned from your clients? I think it's a different path for every human being. Some people are able to grasp concepts and apply them quickly. And other times it you know, might take someone two or three times longer to apply that. But having the patience and standing by their side is very critical in that process. And she and I have a lot of patience and just continue to support them without getting frustrated, even if they're frustrated because it doesn't help anybody be able to overcome their challenges. So I think um, learning patience, but also understanding people on a deeper level can really just be empowering itself. I do want to respect our your time. I know we had technical glitches, but do you st do you have a few more minutes? Yes, we do. Awesome. Um, with this past year, what has it been your observation when it comes to uh, families, divorce? in a COVID world? I think COVID has created some additional struggles for families, given the, some families didn't feel comfortable transporting their children back and forth. They wanted to be more um, conscious of their children's health needs. I think it also created additional, yeah conflict because maybe one parent was on board with how things were being more, I don't know, germ conscious or making sure their child is wearing a mask. And maybe the other parent is like, no, I don't want to put my child through that. So we have additional conflict there that has definitely um, come up over the past year. Other than that, I would say families are still functioning on their normal routine. So it's just a matter of trying to figure out that, again, it's a difference of parenting styles that I would say came up in terms of things that we had to help families like work through and find that middle ground of two different perspectives. Did you also find that, um, you know, one parent ended up getting more time with the kids because of our COVID world? All of our families still kept with their parenting time. So that wasn't really a concern for any of our families. There wasn't a time where one parent kept the children longer than the other. So they all still abide by their parenting agreement. That still had to be rough, though, if you have one parent that, you know, didn't feel safe being in, you know, maybe in, in public spaces with their kids. Um, I mean, that, I mean, that's, you know, if you look back on, you know, the two of you starting a business, who would have thunk that you would have needed COVID training? <laughs> well, to be honest, it's kind of like any other aspect in life. There's going to always be circumstances that are out of our control. We can either choose to operate from a fear mindset, or we can learn to operate from a love mindset and figure out how we're going to find a solution and move, move forward so everybody feels at peace and has security and respect within that situation. So when we operate from fear, then that's when we tend to operate more out of control and out of emotions. When we operate from our heart, we operate out of love. We operate out of solution-focused um, mentality. 
So it's all about a mindset in terms of how you handle any situation in life. Because life's always going to throw us curveballs. That's just life. We're always going to have ups and downs. There's always going to be a roller coaster of things that come unexpectedly. So it's our mindset that gets us through it and how we handle it. How can this audience reach out to the two of you? They can reach out to us at divorcefamilymediations.com or they can always find us on Instagram as well and shoot us a DM. Um, so, or they can uh, fill out the consult, set up a consultation with us on our website. Uh, hold on. So I didn't realize you ladies were on, on the IG as, oh, as, yes. as the kids would say. Uh, I'm, I want to follow you ladies. Uh, what's the, what's the IG? It is divorce family mediation. All There's one no, word. Yes. All one word, man. You've lucked out. <laughs> it's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. Divorce family. That's one thing when I, I, I set up our emails or our social media, or our website, I never think about how long I'm making something that I'm like, gosh, why did I make this so long? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you have a new follower. Cool. I just, I, I just, I just followed you two ladies. Found you, followed you back. Word. Or as the kids would never say <laughs> anymore. <laughs> that, it, it's so fun having. Well, pretty soon she won't be a teenager. I have, well, my son's a teenager, but uh, the girls just look at me when I, when I try and still be that eighties hip guy. And it is like, nobody says that anymore. So well, apparently, at, least, at least you have teenagers in the household who can keep you up to date on the current lingo that's going around. Um, yeah. And then I just look at him going, I have no idea what you're talking about. And let's keep it that way. <laughs> All right, so here's here's uh, I'm excited about asking the, the the last question to you both because I might get because as, as twins I might either get the same answer or this question is just going to go off the rails. So I'm excited about this. So <laughs> great, looking forward to this. One. <laughs> All right, so here it is. If you could step into my shoes, actually I'm wearing socks. What would you have asked? yourselves that I did not ask if you could ask in if you two were 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 sitting in my seat right now actually I'm sitting in my wife's office but that's another story um what would you have asked that I didn't that I didn't ask um perhaps like who do you specifically work with um we actually, besides working with just co-parents, we actually work with children as well to help children actually process their feelings and go through the divorce process and help them navigate their feelings, how to help them better connect with their parents as well and ask for what it is that they need when they're not receiving their needs met at either household with each parent. Is that a consensus from the, uh, the gallery? Yes. Um, another question that you may have asked us, not only do we do co-parenting, coaching, and children, um, how do we help parents create the best plan of action in order to meet the children's needs? So we also help create parenting plans that they can file with the court or send off to their lawyer as well, because we come from why the law, family law is has its own way of doing things, but it doesn't always meet the psychological and emotional needs of the children. So we take it a step further in our parenting plans and really make sure we're meeting the children's emotional and psychological needs on top of what is considered just the basic laws. I know you're tippy towing around the line. I'll say it for you. Family court's a joke. It's a joke. It's very frustrating because it does not respond always respect what is best for the children. So yes, I agree with you a hundred percent. And that's frustrating for us because we're very, we're all about meeting the children's needs and making sure to minimize their emotional distress. Adults can handle themselves. Obviously uh, they, they're mature enough. Children 
it has a long lasting impact on their well being. So we want to minimize that. Yeah, I am. Um, I, I am going to be one of those rare people to say that I actually, um, and it's only because it, it the judgment ruled in in um, my favor, but I have had past guests on this podcast. I've seen it on, you know, other social media where family court just does not get it. It does like you, you both have, have mentioned throughout this uh, conversation, you know, what's best for the kids and family court, family court does not see it. They don't, they don't get it. You're absolutely yeah. right. And they also don't understand coaching either. So most of the time they'll bring on like a therapist. Why we have our background in therapy, it's not how we approach situations. Therapy is meant for us just to listen and reflect back on how we got to where we are today. She and I are too solution focused to just sit there and be like, okay, let's just understand why we are. No, we need solutions in place. We need to be proactive. We need to move forward to happier and healthier functioning. And that's why coaching allows us to be more solution focused and get that plan of action into place so people can move on with their lives. Um, but yeah, family court, it does not understand or respect the emotional and psychological needs. And unfortunately, some of their rulings, I've seen or heard lots of different cases where they will can rule something that just doesn't meet the children's needs. So you're, if you and your co-parent can communicate long enough to make your own parenting plan for your children through uh, co-parenting or mediation services like we provide, then you're better off making those decisions for your children because you know your children best. Like a big issue is like when to introduce the children to a new spouse or someone they're dating. A lot of times we need to wait till that person's been significant enough long enough that way the children don't think there's always going to be somebody new or something it doesn't create stability for their health and like I said children learn love and trust through their parents in the family home and if there's always going to be a new partner coming and going it doesn't allow them to feel safe and so a lot of times we want to allow like a six months to a year to introduce a new partner to the children in order for their own psychological development. So that's something that we tend to focus on when talking about what's best for the children and how things are going to move forward. I, yeah, I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. And I, you know, again, what I've witnessed with other, it doesn't in, it, it didn't matter if it was a, a man or woman, a lot of times after the divorce, they're trying to find the next, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Wrong. And it's like, why? Why? Number one, you should find yourself. You know, what? what is it that maybe during that marriage, maybe you had, you know, some, some hobby or something you want to do and you, you know, put it on the, the so-called bookshelf and now you want to dust it off. And you know, that's number one. Number two is how are you going to be able to, you know, maintain that relationship with your kids if you're not in the same household? So I, I totally agree that you, you need space before you start dating. You need to figure out what is going to, um, you know, be best for you and what's going to be best for the kids. Right. The healing process does take time. And anybody who takes the time to really heal after their divorce will build their inner strength to move forward and they will attract a healthier partner. Sometimes you have individuals who don't want to face the pain. They don't want to heal. They look for an external vice or a new relationship in order to fulfill that void or pain within them. And so when we look externally versus internally, that's what gets somebody into a relationship that's probably not going to be healthy. Because if you're just jumping from one relationship to the next, you're not, that person's probably not meeting your needs on a deeper level. It's just somebody to 
fulfill your ego on a surface level and look for that validation and gratification. Yeah. It'll just be the same type of partner. It's just the face is going to change of the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a a friend of mine who was uh, a constant dater and I would say to him, you're dating cereal. He goes, what do you mean? I go, you're dating cereal, even though it's, you're, you're, you know, looking at lucky charms or fruit loops or, uh, frosted flakes, you're still dating cereal. None of these, uh, women are really anything that is going to make you, you know, somewhat better and vice versa. So, uh, yeah, it it's, it just gets frustrating because I have somebody that I know who after his divorce, he dated somebody else. Then he, then they broke up and then he dated somebody else and he broke up and he went back to the, the, it's like, dude, come on, put your kids first and figure out who you are. And I just, I, I really wanted to shake him. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I like the serial analogy. That's a good one. Uh, I haven't heard that one before, but you're absolutely right. He needs to take a step back and heal himself and focus on himself. He can only, we can own the relationship with ourself determines every other relationship around us. So if the relationship with ourself is not solid, is not based on our core values, is not fulfilling within itself, then it's going to be very hard to have a healthy and happy marriage or partnership. And be able to connect with your children because if Mm -hmm. you're disconnected with yourself, how can you connect with others and relate to what they're feeling in the moment or understand what your children need when they're having a tough day? Yeah. And, and if you start serial dating, what are you saying to your kids? I mean, from saying I don't value myself that I'll just take anybody that will walk into my life that will give me validation. There you go. Well, Jan, Jillian, Yuhas, Divorce Family Mediations, this has been awesome. Um, I'm still hurt that you you left my city of Chicago, but <laughs> I, yeah, that's okay. Go somewhere where the sunshine <laughs> stays out a little longer. Yeah, but the pizza's better in Chicago. Well, we kind of stick to a gluten-free diet, so (laughs) we're not really on the pizza train anyways in terms of, but I hear you. Yes, the deep dish is much probably better in Chicago than it's going to be in Dallas, so. (laughs) Well, if I'd known this was going to be a gluten-free podcast, I I would have changed my coffee. I don't know. I don't know. No, we, we still have our morning coffee. So that's definitely still part of our lifestyle. Can't yeah. get rid of that one. <laughs> no. Need to keep the blood pumping. Yes. Well, ladies, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate between our technical glitches, but I really appreciate uh, your time. Uh, I, again, love your passion of serving uh, families, blended families, you know, people going through divorce. I'm just, I'm again, grateful that you, you came on this podcast. Thank you so much for having us. We truly uh, loved it. So it was great getting to speak with you and uh, learning more about you personally as well. And we'll please stay in touch. <laughs> well, hopefully you didn't learn too much. Hopefully, you know, you, you're not going to have to, uh, you know, wash your brain out with bleach, you know, just to eliminate some of the, the craziness. But, uh, as I tell everybody, I'm a, I'm transparent, I'm open and honest. So, uh, I I I love therapy. I've loved I've always loved therapy, and this is my therapy. Getting to, uh, speaking to uh, professionals such as you two. Thank you again for having us. It was it's been a pleasure, Tommy, and we definitely enjoyed our heart to heart talk. Don't forget to pick up my book at the website mydadsadvicebook.com. Mydadsadvicebook.com. Hey. What's your favorite park? <laughs> <laughs>